Okay, the February 4th meeting of the Thousand Oaks Council on Aging is now being called to order. Uh, will you now join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Francine, will you please call the roll? Please say here are present when I call your name. Commissioner Allen. Present. Commissioner Fotheringham. Here. Commissioner Gorbach. Here. Commissioner Hagee. Here. Commissioner Healy. Here. Commissioner Kopaz. Here. Commissioner Norkin. Here. Commissioner O'Connor. Here. And Commissioner Shentas. Thank you. All right, item four on our agenda is public comments. Um, we have three public comments today. Uh, and I'll uh, introduce these in order. Our first speaker is Jane Messier. Yes, you got here first, Jane. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to come late next time. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, the Senior Adult Master Plan Transportation Committee <laughs> is back in action at the Goebel Center. We'll be doing our first workshop of the year, February 25th at Goebel from 12.30 to 2. And reservations are required because it's a very popular event. And you would call 805-381-2744 to reserve your seat. Um, basically, we show people, seniors, how to get around without their car and to not be afraid of trying something new because I know as we get older we tend to cocoon a little bit and have a hard time getting out of our comfort zone so we try to do something about that we'll be talking about changes uh, upcoming changes to both dial a ride and fixed route and we'll be um, also discussing the brand new mileage reimbursement program which has had a huge response we'll be talking about that as well so Although this event uh, has been designed for seniors, we do not card anyone at the door, so anyone can come. Um, senior wannabes, welcome. Um, and I'm glad to see Dr. Davis here. Uh, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be here. So council can blame him for that later. So for, uh, <laughs> for um, transportation team, that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Mickey Toyan. Good afternoon. I'm Mickey Toyan. Um, I'm representing the Global Senior Center Commission, and we are putting on an event on February 15th. It's called History Comes Alive with Fred Stone, who is the most uh, famous painter of horses in the world. Um, his, um, his artwork is in the White House as well as in Queen Elizabeth's home. Uh, Fred is going to talk about reflections of his golden age of many, many different racehorses that he has painted, jockeys, and trainers. And if you have not seen his work, it is just really, really incredible. Um, one of his most famous um, uh, pieces of art was called Partners, and I don't know if they're going to show it on the screen, but it's, it's the fireman and the, the golden retriever from 9-11, and um, he'll be selling them at a very nominal price uh, when he speaks on February 15th, and it's at 2 o'clock. Tickets are only $5. Uh, we expect a big crowd, so we hope that you could, uh, you could pre-register and purchase tickets ahead of time. They don't have to wait in line. And um, we look forward for um, everybody to, to be there and support Fred. And um, hey, Fred is 84 years young and um, still going strong. I spoke to him this morning, and he just can't wait. So, again, it's Sunday, February 15th at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mickey. And our final speaker is Andrea Gallagher. Thank you very much. 
Um, I'm here today to thank uh, the Council on Aging and the City of Thousand Oaks for their support and work on our caregiver appreciation event that we had last Saturday. We were sold out with 250 caregivers. We also had 30 volunteers. Uh, we had, um, uh, of all of the surveys that we received back, we got them from almost everybody. What we heard was folks came into the meeting or the event feeling exhausted and overwhelmed, and they left feeling appreciated and inspired and comforted. And one of the things that uh, we found is that 60% of the participants that came to this event were caring for a loved one with dementia. The next largest percentage were caring for somebody with old age, so obviously some uh, chronic conditions and such. Uh, this was a first of its ever event in the country. Three cities, the business community, the Chamber of Commerce, and a nonprofit senior concerns all coming together to put on a community event. We consider this to be the first of many. Um, and so stay tuned because it looks like maybe in October or November we'll be having another big event for family caregivers. In the meantime, I wanted to announce that on Tuesday, February 24th, from 5.30 to 7, Senior Concerns will be hosting Compassionate Conversations for Caregivers. And that will be at 401 Hodenkamp Road in Thousand Oaks. You can call to make a reservation at 805-497-0189 or you can email us at info at seniorconcerns.org. Thank you very much. I was a participant. I was a caregiver, one of the 250 caregivers, and that is truly the most difficult job a person, I believe, ever has in their life. I mean, it's, it's so difficult. And, okay, Francine, and it was such a lovely day. I mean, everybody, there were people there care, caring for people with dementia, with old age. I was there. I have a cancer in my family. Um, there were all sorts of things, and somehow it managed, and the speakers managed to touch all those people. So I hope you do it again. It was a wonderful, wonderful day for all of us. Thank, Thank you. you. And the one thing I might mention is we should all look at the Thousand Oaks Acorn. They were there all day taking pictures, and I'm sure there'll be a lovely article about it on Thursday. Thank you again very much for your help and support. Uh, thank you, Andrea. I heard your commitment to do it again in October, so we're counting on that. Mm -hmm. All right. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Vice Chair Healy. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce our commission reports. Uh, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Gorbach and the Senior of the Year update. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, um, we heard that there were 30 volunteers at this wonderful event last weekend. Well, there are more than 1,200 senior volunteers who contribute time and energy to aid more than 80 nonprofit agencies throughout the community. And each year, we honor, we honor those volunteers, and one in particular is elected as Senior of the Year. The Senior of the Year nominations are open now, so you can go to the website at www.toaks for Thousand Oaks dot org forward slash seniors and thanks to francine the link is right at the top of the page simply click on that for your application both individuals can nominate people and organizations can nominate people so you need to do this today now someone might say but why why should we nominate someone as senior of the year well I have here ladies and gentlemen the top five reasons why you need to nominate someone as senior of the year reason number five nominating a person for senior of the year will give that recognition to the individual he or she so richly deserves beyond the free donuts and coffee of course that you bring in on Fridays Reason number four, nominating a person for Senior of the Year will give your organization the recognition it so richly deserves because at the banquet, both your nominee and your organization are recognized for the work that they do. Number three, nominating a person for Senior of the Year will shine a spotlight on the value of volunteerism in our community and that there is always a need for more senior volunteers. Number two, nominating a person for a senior of the year takes only a few minutes and will give you a well-deserved break in the middle of your busy day. 
You can fill out the short nomination form directly on the computer, click submit, and it's done. Or if you prefer, print it out and send it into Francine at the City of Thousand Oaks. And the number one reason why you should nominate a person for Person of the Year is that you and your nominee will be invited to attend the awards banquet on June 4th at 4th at 5:30 at the Global Center, where we'll party hardy, enjoy great food, great company, terrific entertainment, wonderful door prizes, and most of all, each other's company. So today, go online, get that application, and nominate someone for Senior of the Year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our fraud report today will be given by Commissioner Shintas. Well, last month, I uh, discussed identity theft and the things you should do to avoid it. But what if, in spite of your best efforts, you become a victim? Now what? Well, there are two things you should do right away. One is you got to put a fraud alert on your account. You call one of the three uh, credit reporting agencies and ask them to do that and ask them also to tell the other two agencies to do the same thing. And that will prevent people from using your name and your information to open up an account in <laughs> their account in your name. After that, uh, the other thing you have to do is go to the police department and file a report. The police department aren't won't be able to help you very much, but having the report will help you because it uh, gives you some credibility. It's a crime to make a false police report, so having that report will be a help in trying to straighten things out. After that, it's up to the individual because every case is different. There's no boilerplate you can follow. The only thing I can suggest at this point is you get a hold of the Federal Trade Commission they are the government agency that is responsible for fraud. And you can hit them on the internet at www.ftc.gov. And there you'll find a wealth of information on the problem. That's it. Thank you, Martin. Uh, our next report will be on legislation. And Commissioner Hagee, Ron, you are up. Okay, our uh, state legislature, in their infinite wisdom, figured we don't have enough laws in California. So this year, this is 130, 130 sheets of paper. 130 new laws? No. Here's 800. 930 new laws for California. Uh, I may take a little bit of time. I'm going to read all those. No, I'm not going to read them today, but... I'll go over I'll go over some of those laws in the future because we don't I don't want to give Francine a heart attack over there. We um, but what I would suggest is there's a wonderful website. It's uh, leg info ledgeinfo dot legislature dot cal dot gov, and this website you can. Uh, you can find out what these new laws are, and if you have a particular interest in any uh, singular law, uh, you can get all the details at this website. So today I'm just going to let you know that we have all these new wonderful laws, and then in the future I'll go over some of them. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Our last commission report today is on emergency preparedness, and Commissioner Kopes will do that for us. Alan, Alan. 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 yes, yeah. we know her well. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right, I answer. Yeah. Okay, I just real quickly, I just wanted to remind everybody about the VC alert capability we're fortunate to have here in Thousand Oaks and Ventura County. And um, currently, it's the state-of-the-art reminder uh, or alert if there's something that's health or safety related that covers either your section where you live, they can segment it quite a bit. So um, you do need to uh, register for it. It has all of the listed and unlisted phone numbers in um, um, 
AT&T and Verizon customers. They don't sell the information or share the information with anybody. But uh, what it will do um, once you sign up, and I'll give you a little information about that at the end, is it will... Whatever mechanism you choose, you can have them call your home phone, your cell phone, your uh, send you an email, fax, um, all sort. There's several different ways, and you can use multiple ways. And what it will do is it will alert you about the um, what the uh, thing is that's happening, and it'll keep trying to get in touch with you on your if you choose phone it'll keep trying to get in touch with you on the phone and, until either a, you answer someone answers or you have a answer machine because it's uh would, and it's done that for me it's less left the messages on um the answer machine on my answer machine so anyway it's very easy to sign up for um you can go to the city of thousand oaks page type in vc alert and or you can call a phone number 805-648- 9283 and they will assist you in signing up but um, you know they're always saying it's not a matter of if we have an earthquake or an emergency but it's just when so i urge you all to sign up for that thank you very mm -hmm. much yeah. um should we go on to the next ones uh, to hey thank you vice chair healy um the uh, our item five on our agenda is uh, well, we're ready for six. 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 Mm -hmm. Next page. Item six on our agenda is liaison reports. Um, in addition to being an advisory body to the city council, uh, the council on aging has also um, appoints commissioners to act as liaisons to various organizations. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, to recognize Commissioner Copaz to. Uh, Oh, Commissioner O'Connor. Sorry, I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> we really know each other. <laughs> Who will Thank introduce you. our liaison reports. Thank you, Nick. I'm speaking on behalf of the director of the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program, Rick Tanaka. And um, the first thing on the, um, on the report <clears throat> is that the Wellness Fest was such a wonderful, amazing success. And for anyone that was there, they, I know they all appreciate it. There were over 500 people there and s over 70 vendors. So uh, Rick would also like to thank Los Robles Hospital and UCLA Health for sponsoring and helping them with this great event. I, I have a feeling you'll hear a little more about that today. So the one thing that um, he wanted you all to know, because it started yesterday, is about uh, the income tax uh, assistance and it is a new location and it's on different days but I would like to read that so I don't miss anything in cooperation with the Internal Revenue Service trained and certified CSVP volunteers will provide free income tax preparation for persons in either of these categories seniors who are 60 years of age or older, any income level, or persons with an income of $50,000 or less, regardless of age. And as I mentioned, it started yesterday, and it goes through Wednesday, April 15th, 2015, and it's on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at these locations. And note, it is a new location. It will be at the Newberry Park Library, on 2331 Borchard Road, and that's Wednesdays, 9 to 2, or the Caneo Creek South Community Building, 1350 East Jans Road, Thousand Oaks, and that's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays from 9 to 4. And it's not the building on the corner. It's more towards where uh, the soccer fields are. So if you're going there, I'm sure it'll be, um, there'll be some signs. No appointments are taken. It's first come, first serve. And this is the p participants should bring the following items. Photo identification and Social Security card. Social Security Benefit Statement SSA-1099. 
wage and earning statements, W-2s and 1099s, property tax bill, interest and dividend statements, as well as the cost of stocks and bonds with the date bought and sold, a copy of last year's federal and state return, bank routing, routing numbers and account numbers for direct deposit, other relevant information about income and expenses, no rental, business income and expenses for Schedule C, only if there's a profit and expenses are under $10,000. So that sounds like a lot. For those of you who are here, there is a flyer in the back, and if you want to go by the Global Center, there's information there as well. So we hope you take advantage of this um, assistance. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, do I introduce her? Um, yes, we'll now hear from uh, Patty Ham from the Global Center. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Um, as Commissioner O'Connor spoke about the Wellness Fest, we were so excited about our first efforts, and uh, CSVP uh, did us proud, um, with, along with the staff at the Global Center. Uh, we put a lot of love and effort into that event, and uh, it showed, and we got a great response from um, our sponsors, our vendors, our community providers, and uh, also our seniors, our awesome seniors who came to the event uh, to support us, and it was uh, the first fundraising uh, major event for CSVP, and it was very successful, and uh, we just plan on next year it being even better um, years to come. Uh, Global Center, February. It's a month of very exciting things happening and a month of love, of course, Valentine's Day. We're celebrating next Saturday on Valentine's Day with a Valentine's Day dinner for seniors. Um, it is, we're going to provide an Italian dinner with a salad and garlic bread and the Reserve of Thousand Oaks is coming over to join us and they're going to be providing the wine. And the best part of this event is, wait for it, wait for it, we're going to be showing Mamma Mia on the movie screen and it's the sing-along version. So we're going to be dancing and singing in the aisles and having a great time. So I hope everybody can make it. It's going to be so much fun. We're very excited. And uh, if you don't have any, you know, solid plans for Valentine's Day, come on over and join us and join the Gobel family and have some fun. And it's $5 per senior. You can sign up at the front desk at the, se at the Senior Center. And um, the next day is the History Comes Alive. The commissioner um, Toyin told you about that. And uh, that's the commission event. That's also $5. And Fred Stone will be coming and speaking with us. And they just had this past Sunday a commission event where they had a Frank Sinatra um, look-alike and impersonator come and sing. We had over, we had 200 seniors fill our auditorium for that performance, and it was incredible. And it brought back uh, a lot of great moments for seniors. And he he had an incredible voice, sounded just like him. He even did a little bit of impersonation of Sammy Davis Jr. and um, Oh goodness. Thank you. No, Dean Martin. Dean Martin. And it was it was fun. And uh that music, who doesn't love that that golden age music, right? So that was a lot of fun. So they've been very successful in providing some really fun things for the seniors. And then lastly, I'd like to tell you about uh, another commission event. On Friday, February 27th, the commission is going to try a nighttime bingo for the first time. So they've gotten a lot of feedback from people who maybe don't come to the daytime bingo because they're either working or they just can't make the daytime. So we're going to provide a nighttime bingo on Friday, February 27th, and the doors will open at 6. The sales will end promptly at 645, and bingo will start at 7. And we will also be providing uh, food for for a fee um, if you can't if you want to come straight from work and come over and get your tickets um, it should be a fun night and uh, just to reiterate the tax program has moved it what had been at the senior center for many years 
Um, it has moved across the street to the uh, Conejo Creek Community Building. And it's the building in the middle of the soccer fields with the red roof, the only building with the red roof. So look for the red roof. That is it. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Patty. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, just a, a very, very quick thank you to Patty and the Goebel Center and the Commission. I've attended a couple events there over the last couple of weeks, and they are fabulous. We are so lucky in this community to have the programs that the Goebel Center and its Commission provides. The Frank Sinatra event was outstanding, really outstanding. And then I was there um, last Friday for a free event that was done in coordination with Los Robles Hospital called Sidewalk CPR, and it was very, very important, and if you ever have a chance to attend an event like that, you have to do that. It shows you how to do CPR um, just by using chest compressions and um, not doing the mouth-to-mouth, the -mouth. and we practiced, and I am absolutely confident that should the need ever arise, I can be someone to help save a life. So you you need to do that also. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Karen. And now I'd like to introduce Commissioner Kopatz, who will introduce our guest speaker for today. Thank you. In recognition of National Heart Month, we are honored today to have Dr. Dev who will be sharing valuable information on the prevention and treatment of heart disease. Dr. Dev has received numerous awards and honors and has written more than 60 papers and has contributed chapters to at least 10 books. From 2004 to 2005, he was director of the Cardiac uh, Catheterization Laboratory at Los Robles Hospital and was chief of staff from 2005 to 2007. Since 2006, Dr. Dev has served as Medical Director, Cardiovascular Services at Los Robles Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Dev. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Kopex. Uh, and thank you to the Council on Aging and the City of Thousand Oaks for giving me this opportunity for this presentation uh, to the citizens of this wonderful city that we live in. The uh, topic for today is Thousand Oaks living the best place to live on the planet? No, it's not. It's advances in therapy of cardiovascular diseases. And uh, to give you a background, cardiovascular disease, as everybody knows to some degree, is um, highly prevalent. Over 80 million Americans, one-third of the entire country, has some form of cardiovascular disease or the other. Over 16 million Americans have coronary heart disease. Heart attack or myocardial infarction has happened in about 8 million people. Occurs in about a million, little under a million people every year. Angina pectoris or the chest pain related to blocked arteries in about 10 million. So heart attack. In 2008, approximately 2 million Americans had a new or recurrent coronary event or a heart attack. About 800,000 of these are what we call first heart attacks. And a significant number are repeat heart attacks. And some of them would be, a substantial number of them, unfortunately, would be lethal. So what I intend to do in the next 30 minutes or so is um, go over some patient stories. And that just will bring a perspective to how the heart disease can present. So the first patient is a 39-year-old male, high cholesterol, strong family history, and he presented to the emergency room with history of chest pain for the prior two days. He didn't think it was anything related to the heart, so he kept doing his thing. It became quite severe. He started sweating. And when he was going to work that day, he realized he can't do any, go any further, and he drove to the emergency room. 
he had prior history of similar milder symptoms. The electrocardiogram in the emergency room showed ST elevation myocardial infarction or called the STEMI, like the heart attack. Now that shows the blocked artery in the panel on the left and after we have put a stent and fixed you can see that area that's pinched is now open in the panel to the right and that took about 30 minutes from the time that he hit our emergency room door till the time that those arteries were opened. So let's go over what uh, the heart attack is. What is this coronary heart disease all about? And this is a, a picture of a heart, a painting of a heart in fact, a cartoon, and it shows the heart from the front. And you see the red are the arteries and there are there is an artery that arises on the left side called left coronary artery and that immediately divides into two branches, one that goes to the front and one that goes to the left side and to the back. And then there is the right coronary artery, which arises on the right side of the panel and goes around the right corner of the heart and also goes to the lower surface of the heart. This is called the right coronary artery. So hence, we call them three coronary arteries, two that arise as a common stem from the left side and one on the right side. And this is what happens to the artery if you cut a cross-section of the artery. And you can see that from 3 o'clock to 10 o'clock, the artery has enormous amount of plaque buildup. And right in the center, the light red color is what we call the vulnerable plaque. That's the soft, cholesterol-rich area. The bluish area is fibrous tissue or scar tissue-like slightly tougher tissue. And right where you see the red is closest to the, the white area, which is the inner lumen, is where the, that thin lining gets abraded and you form a blood clot. And right where that arrow is, where that rupture, so to say, of the plaque happened, and then you formed blood clot that suddenly causes a transition from a 30, 40, 50, 60 percent blocked artery to a completely blocked artery. And that's what causes the heart attack. So this is meant to be a video, but the video may not work. But the front artery gets blocked and the area beyond that then gets damaged. So that's basically, and that stops working. You can see it visibly, it doesn't contract anymore. A second story is a 59-year-old male, and he had chest pain. He was working at a construction site, and he complained that he wasn't feeling well. And before he could actually get off the ladder, he stumbled. Fortunately, he wasn't very high up, and fell, and became unresponsive, had cardiac arrest. There was no bystander CPR. And that's an issue that we will talk about as well. Uh, fortunately, this was construction very close to a fire station, so they reached very promptly. And he was given CPR, he was intubated, he had cardiac arrest, and was given a shock, recovered, and was brought to the hospital. And it again, the electrocardiogram showed heart attack. We did a CAT scan to make sure there was no injury to the brain because that has bearing on what we do with them. And here is his artery on the left panel is a completely blocked artery with a tiny branch that goes to, towards the right. And on the right panel, you see the artery after being opened. And the moment the artery was opened, his rhythm got stabilized and we knew that his heart has now started recovering already. However, he was unresponsive. We did not know how much degree of damage had happened to his brain because of lack of oxygen. And this is supposed to be a video which shows that 
blackened area is where the heart attack is and then that starts an electrical storm which causes the heart to fibrillate it has a very fast erratic muscular activity which does not have any effective pumping ability so the there's no cardiac output so cardiac arrest the heart is not at standstill the electrocardiogram that we see on TV showing straight line flat line doesn't happen they have very erratic very irregular very rapid rate that's what causes cardiac arrest eventually it becomes a flat line because everything stops so in this gentleman after we opened up the artery and stopped the heart attack we needed to help his brain to recover and we started him on what we call therapeutic hypothermia that means we lower the body temperature as a therapy to protect the brain from ongoing damage because of lack of oxygen we know that lack of oxygen to the brain starts damage early however it's not a one step damage it happens and is perpetuated by the events that follow cardiac arrest so the goal of this approach is to lower the body temperature to 32 degrees Celsius which is around 90 degrees Fahrenheit it and then slowly warm up for 24 hours of 32 degrees Fahrenheit and then slowly warm the body over the next six to eight hours this is this gentleman 18 days post his cardiac arrest he is very proudly walking his uh, IV stand with him and walked home with essentially no brain damage mm -hmm. so post cardiac arrest hypothermia is not a new thing the first CPR first resuscitation paper that was written the first thesis the first playbook that was written on this was written by somebody who said start the ABC of life airways breathing and circulation and he said after you're done with that then start lowering the body temperature if the patient is not responsive the strange thing is that this he said in 1964 50 years ago for about 50 years we've been frozen literally because post arrest hypothermia till recently was not very widely practiced or very widely available we know it saves lives and we know you should know and feel assured that your local hospital has all the facilities needed for it so what are the symptoms of a heart attack the classical symptoms are chest pain or pressure an elephant sitting on the chest with some radiation to the jaw to the throat to the shoulders to the arms unfortunately it does not have to follow every part of the complex sometimes the discomfort is just below the ribcage sometimes it's just in the shoulders sometimes it's just on the in the jaw or the throat sometimes people feel markedly weak sometimes feel markedly short of breath they feel lightheaded or they could faint sometimes the symptoms are in the upper abdomen just below the ribcage with discomfort nausea and vomiting and they think it's their stomach or an acid reflux very close mimic of a heart attack the truth is any of those symptoms that start suddenly should be assumed to be a heart attack unless proven otherwise so let's divide the jobs your job not the person who's having a heart attack don't ignore symptoms if you think you're having a heart attack chew two tablets of aspirin there's a large body of data that showed aspirin alone lowered heart attack mortality by 22% call 911 do not drive to the emergency room 
do not ask family members or friends to drive you to the emergency room. If alone, unlock the door if possible after calling 911. Don't need to fix your hair or makeup. <laughs> Our job, identify heart attack fast. In fact, the goal is to identify heart attack before the patient reaches the emergency room. In Ventura County, now, all paramedic rigs are equipped with an EKG machine which actually is standardized to read heart attack. The paramedics, they do not interpret the EKG. They just read the report. It says heart attack suspected. They activate the system. While they are leaving from home with the patient, I'm leaving from home going to the cath lab. So what it does is activates the system, the therapeutic entire system, including the cath lab, the cardiologist, the emergency room, the staff, the nurses, the EKG technician, at the same time as the patient is actually being moved to the emergency room. Most of the times, the entire staff is ready to take care of the patient as soon as the patient reaches the emergency room. Get vital medications to you fast. For that, we actually created a heart attack pack. If you've been to a hospital, you know that every time doctor orders a medication, the nurse goes to the medication cabinet, punches in her number, draws out. Sometimes that medication is missing, calls the, the pharmacy. Every medication requires the same thing. For a heart attack, we may require 10 medications in three minutes. So we decided to create a heart attack kit. Everything conceivable that would be required for taking care of the patient is in that pack. In many cases, it's a waste of resources, but it's a waste of minor amount of resources with a major benefit when you need them. The nurse does not leave the room. They open the heart attack pack, and everything is there that they need. It includes the long tubing that is needed for the cath lab, the whole nine yards, and we spent a fair amount of time devising it. Also, it's a reminder. Sometimes in a hurry, people don't realize certain medications, even doctors, are valuable, but they don't get given because they don't think of it because a lot of other bad things are happening. As, as while in the heart attack pack says, oh, doc, did you give this medication? So, oh, yeah. Saves time. Also, make sure all essential steps are taken. Open up the blocked artery fast. The goal is to open up the blocked artery so that blood flow, oxygen, Meta metabolic agents are delivered to the injured heart muscle cells as fast as possible. Help the damaged heart recover and start the steps to prevent another heart attack fast before the patient goes home. And this graph shows that sooner you open up the artery, less the damage to the heart muscle, lower the mortality, less the residual symptoms, the difference between opening an artery at one hour versus six hours could be between a person who can run a marathon versus a person who would be a cardiac cripple. So how do we open the arteries? And this cartoon shows a whole host of devices uh, that we've used. Essentially, the two things that really have made a difference are the balloon angioplasty and the stent. Stents are mounted on the balloon, so balloon angioplasty is an essential part of the entire procedure anyway. And here is a stent which is now loaded in this cartoon of an artery on the thin shaft. This is a collapsed stent. It's crimped down to a very low profile so that it can be introduced from a small artery in the groin, in, in, from the groin, from the leg artery, and it's very small profile. It can navigate through the curves easily. And then we expand it and it sticks itself into the wall and becomes a scaffolding to the wall to prevent the artery and the plaque from collapsing and blocking the, uh, the artery again. A newer version of stents that started in 2004, and we now have the third generation of newer drug-eluting stents. In addition to the scaffolding, it also releases a small amount of drug that prevents scar tissue formation and re-blockage of the artery with the body's healing process. Here is an artery 
If you see on the left panel, right in the middle, its artery is pinched. And after a stent, on the right panel, you can tell it's wide open. Uh, that's the stent, and it should be a 20-minute procedure. So uh, here is another pattern in which heart muscle damage can, can behave. Uh, this is a 35-year-old lady. She was pregnant, 37 weeks. Rapidly progressive shortness of breath within two hours from driving her daughter and her friend from school to their house, she became so short of breath and she came to the emergency room. Her heart function had deteriorated to 20%. Before she could be taken up for delivery, she had uh, respiratory and cardiac arrest. She was resuscitated, the baby was delivered, and the she was started on a supportive care. Angiogram showed she did not have any blocked arteries. So from a normal heart, her heart function went down from ejection fraction of, let's say, 60% to 20% within a short period of time without a blocked artery. That's a direct myocardial damage, a cardiomyopathy, sometimes related to pregnancy, sometimes related to a virus infection called viral myocarditis, and few other things. So she was started on an intra-aortic balloon pump. Then we brought in a new device at that time called the impeller device, which is assist the left ventricle by pulling out blood from the main pumping chamber and pumping it into the aorta. And this is on a catheter. And then she was airlifted to a transplant center where she spent two weeks on the cardiac assist devices and then miraculously, completely recovered. Her heart function, about six weeks later, was back to low end of normal. In three months, was completely normal. And four years later, five years later, last year, she gave birth to another mm -hmm. wonderful child without having any problems. This is the Impala device, and it doesn't seem like the video is going to work. The next thing that I thought we would touch, because this is a console on aging, and aging has few things. The degenerative disorders of the body become more and more prevalent. Aortic stenosis is a very common problem and above 65 years of age, 16 and a half million people, and this is an older data, and now this number is reaching close to 20 million people, have aortic stenosis. Major risk factors, just age, more common in men, high blood pressure, smoking, and high cholesterol. Strangely, a lot of risk factors that are also associated with coronary artery disease that we just talked about. And so, not uncommonly, these two things happen together. And if you notice smoking, a lot of these people also have lung disease. So, symptoms of aortic stenosis also very often would overlap. The chest pain, shortness of breath, but these things don't start suddenly. So that's the difference between heart attack and other issues related to lungs or the heart. The suddenness of new symptoms. I think that's the key thing about a heart attack. So the trouble with aortic stenosis is, and this is, aortic stenosis is narrowing of the valve that guards the blood being pumped out from the main pumping chamber to the entire body from the left ventricle to the aorta. An aortic valve opens when the heart contracts and closes when the heart is relaxing, letting the heart fill from the lungs. When it becomes narrow, then the heart has to pump blood through a very narrow orifice. 
and the main pumping chamber then gets overly stressed and with time and progressive narrowing of the valve eventually fails. How to identify it? Fortunately, because it's a very forceful pumping of blood against a narrowed orifice, it produces a heart murmur. Not all heart murmurs are aortic stenosis, but you can tell with listening to the stethoscope which heart murmur is likely aortic stenosis. And then, of course, it's very easy to identify on echocardiography, which is non-invasive ultrasound and Doppler scan of the heart. The trouble is, once aortic stenosis becomes symptomatic, then the fall off from relatively stable curve where the prognosis is good is very steep. And after significant symptoms, after onset of angina, for example, the average survival in this large study was five years. After the episode of syncope or fainting, it was three years. And once they have congestive heart failure, the survival is just two years. Put that in perspective, severe aortic stenosis, the outcome over a period of time is a lot worse than a lot of things that we think are lethal. Lung cancer, breast cancer, any kind of cancer in fact. So aortic stenosis is a progressively more prevalent problem Older we get, older the population gets, more prevalent it's going to be. And once it starts producing symptoms, and it has crossed a certain level of blockage, the outcomes are particularly worse. Aortic valve replacement, which is a surgical treatment, improves survival. We know that. That data is strong. However, Aortic stenosis, aortic valve surgery now is open heart surgery. And aortic stenosis is now becoming prevalent in greater proportion in patients who are particularly 85, 90 plus years of age. Plus they have other problems. They have coronary artery disease, they have lung problems. So it strikes the population at a time when they're least suitable for a major surgery like open heart surgery. So the disease, in a weird way, excludes its only definitive treatment that was available so far. However, in the last 10 years, a hectic amount of research has happened in trying to replace the valve without surgery. And this is the first kind of valve. There are now multiple a third generation of this valve, multiple other valves with evolving, rapidly evolving and finesse technology that are now available. And the logic and the procedure plan is simple. Instead of a surgeon excising the diseased valve and then stitching a valve into the hole that's left, the ring that's left, we actually stitch or stick a valve which is now crimped on a stent and use stent as an anchoring device. So in the arteries we use stent as a scaffolding device to prevent the tunnel or the artery from collapsing. In a stent valve we use the stent to anchor the valve into a narrow ring of tissue where the original valve is. And with the stent valve, we actually don't remove the old valve because the old valve is hard and rough and calcified. We actually st stick the stent into it, it actually holds it. So, and this can be done through the femoral artery again. And this cartoon is meant to show that. There are, these cartoons are actually available on YouTube or on the AdWords website to see how the procedure is done. We can also do it from a, a small incision, about an inch incision, 
at in the left side of the thorax, right where the apex of the heart is. So we stab the heart from there and cross the valve from inside out and place the valve. So if somebody said 15 years ago that we could actually replace the aortic valve without surgery, uh, that person would have been laughed out from the room. And uh, because the whole process was considered to be a sacred area where there is only solution is surgery, or if you're too old, then you give up. We now have, we started this program in Los Robles Hospital uh, in July. This, uh, be, we waited till the device became, uh, the size became small enough that it could easily be deployed from the femoral artery without anything major. The device size is actually reducing rapidly, and the trouble with installing the device is it's becoming a much simpler procedure with time. Also, the longevity of the device is now being tested more and more. We already have patients who have had this device for eight to 10 years. So we know now that this device likely would be used in more and more people. And there could be, in five years' time, devices that would likely be approved and suitable for use in a lot younger people. So this is the cutting edge of evolution of the valve technology today. The, a modification of those valves is also now used in the mitral valve, which is the second valve on the left side, which starts leaking in people with enlarged heart. And uh, so this is just mushroom, mushrooming of technology to tackle the valve issues that were only tackled surgically before. We'll now quickly talk about a couple of other things, just mention them, just to give you a perspective of all the things that are happening. And this one is atrial fibrillation. And if we think aortic stenosis was age-related, atrial fibrillation is almost completely age-related. There are some younger people who have episodic atrial fibrillation, but 90% of the atrial fibrillation is age-related. 65 and above. And as if you took people who are 75 and above, the prevalence keeps going up. And above 80 years of age, it's about 8-9% of the population has atrial fibrillation. Above 90, about 10-12% of the population has atrial fibrillation. And it requires treatment uh, in terms of, there are multiple different solutions. Most of the times, as long as the heart rate is controlled and you're on a blood thinner, you are protected. Because the main problem with atrial fibrillation is that the upper chamber of the heart does not contract and you could form a blood clot in the appendage or a small little crescent. It's like a little um, uh, a closet, like in a closet of a room. Uh, it's a finger-like projection. That's where the clots form because the blood circulation is very sluggish. Blood thinning helps. There are devices that we can actually block the appendage. Go put a little tiny plug, and there's a plug that's likely to get approved within a short period of time, and shows that then you do not need to take blood thinners for long. So there are things happening in atrial fibrillation. In younger people uh, with, ep with episodic atrial fibrillation, we can burn the area where the electrical uh, activation of the atrial fibrillation is happening called ablation procedure. Um, the results in people who have continuous atrial fibrillation or persistent atrial fibrillation, the success rate is about 50-60%. But in younger episodic atrial fibrillation, the success rate now is 90 plus percent. This just shows atrial fibrillation increases with age. And of course, the heart failure. Heart failure is the commonest diagnosis for admission to the hospital in our country. It requires multiple things, mostly medical. There are some devices, uh, but I think we don't have enough time in this session to talk about them. So the question is, um, where are we lacking? So this cartoon 
for example, highlights the fact that we have fair amount of research, some we talked about, but in a bizarre way, most of the research till recently was middle-aged men. We didn't have much research on women. And we did not include all age groups. A lot of the studies would exclude people above 80, and of course, younger than 18 for, for specific reasons. But now, people above 80 are a common part of our population that we need to treat. None of the trials really answered that question. And women on, were not so far. And there is now an increased emphasis on research on women and heart disease specifically. I think the key take-home message, and the last few slides basically are a few messages, we need to pay attention to ourselves. He had chest pains, a real wake-up call to slow down a bit. Unfortunately, he was on another line and missed the call. And slow down a bit. That's the iceberg to the Titanic. I would slow down if I were you. <laughs> and here is uh, a trick question. It's my five birds on a wire question. So one of the birds decides to fly away. How many birds are left on the wire? The answer is still five because he just decided to fly. He actually did not fly. <laughs> deciding to fly is not equal to flying. So deciding to stop smoking is not equal to stop smoking. The point is, we know, most of us do, as to what's good for our heart. The point is to start flying and start doing the exercise, eating the right stuff, Quit smoking, taking your medications regularly, uh, keeping an uh, optimal weight. Start that today, because till you fly, you are still on the wire. And this is my tip of the iceberg message. Heart disease, the symptoms of heart disease are the tip of the iceberg. What you see is very little part of what is underneath. If you wait for symptoms, you may be too close to the iceberg, as the Titanic discovered. When they could see it, they were already hitting it. And a sobering part of heart disease, it's very expensive to take care of heart disease. In, a, in an irony of life, more scientific advances happen, more expensive the care gets. At 95, with severe aortic stenosis, 10 years ago, we would just wait for the person to die. Now, we can add valuable life to those 95 years, but at a cost. The accountant doesn't like it. Same thing about numerous other technolo technological advances that we've talked about and some we haven't had time to talk about. But we are a rapidly progressing society in terms of science and evolution, and thank God for that. Because at least in the current environment, though there is now fair amount of disincentive, there is huge amount of capital investment into research and development. And that pays dividend in terms of value, quality, and the extent and duration of life. And that's priceless. But somebody looks at that as a poor choice. That either you spend money because it's expensive to take good care, or you die. In that case, either paper or plastic. That, I hope, wasn't in poor taste with all the stuff that's going on in, around the world today. But um, I appreciate everybody's patience in um, 
in um, listening to my presentation on advances in heart disease. And I'm open for any uh, questions uh, okay. from Thank the you, council. Dr. Dev, we'll now take any questions from the commissioners. Yeah, this is not so Nancy. much a question. Seven uh, Valentine's uh, closer. Okay, uh, seven years ago on uh, 2007 Valentine's Day, I had a heart attack in my office. Did everything wrong. Drove myself home. Spent the night at home by myself. When I drove to the Los Robles ER, thank God they were so responsive so quickly, and I had no idea it was a heart attack. No symptoms that normal you think of, you know. And they had two wonderful cardiac nurses in that cath lab. They were senior nurses. I, I was terrified. I mean, I could have had another heart attack from just being terrified. And then I was assigned Dr. Ali Abadi, who happened to be on duty, and he's still my cardiologist. But they responded so well, so quickly, and in a way that it, it was very calming. They, were, they did a wonderful job for me. So I'm here today, too, because of the cardiac stuff there. So thank you. And thank you for that. That was very informative. <clears throat> thank you. you. Other questions? Well, I have one. Early in your uh, presentation, you showed an image of a uh, cross-section of an artery uh, with a piece of loose cholesterol that ruptured into the lumen and caused a clot. And the clot's treated by then inserting a stent to... Uh, how do you get the stent in without sort of pushing the clot into another part of the the blood circulatory system and causing a, a problem elsewhere? I think that's a very good question. Um, what we would, what we do, to give you an idea of the equipment, so the first thing that crosses the artery is a wire which has a soft end and it measures 14 thousandths of an inch. The stent, when it's crimped on a balloon, is truly a very small caliber compared to the cross-section of the artery. We also give medications, blood thinners, that take care of the clot. If we suspect, so the amount of clot is actually inversely related to the amount of plaque, because the artery is certain size, if there was an 80% blocked artery and it became 100%, then it requires a smaller amount of clot. If it's 20% blocked artery and it's a big artery and it became completely blocked, then it's filled with clot. So what we do now is after the 14 thousandths of an inch wire crossing it, which crosses without moving anything, we actually put a device that sucks the clot out. And then we put the stent covering the raw plaque that needs to be tacked up because it's now ulcerated rough surface is what the body does not like. There are cells in the blood called platelets whose only job, they don't have a nucleus, so they're like headless soldiers. Not that nucleated cells think, but they truly have no nucleus. They just have pieces of uh, cytoplasm with the membrane. So their job is to find a breach in the vascular system and throw themselves clumping together like soldiers holding hands, throwing themselves uh, into a crack in the dam to close it. However, they can't tell whether it's a, a rupture of an artery or a rough inner lining of the artery. They, do this, they treat it the same way. So the platelets clump together and plug up and they're trying to prevent a bleed out. However, all that they're doing is plugging up an artery that just has a rough surface. Mm. The point that I'm making is that rough surface, if you leave it alone by just sucking out the clot, likely would get exposed to more clot. So you need to cover it and remove the blockage by putting the stent in and expanding it. Mm -hmm. There are situations where we've seen that after we suck out the clot, the artery looks normal. In that case, we do not put a stent. So that's a judgment based upon what we see after we remove the clot. In many situations, the clot is um, small, but enough to cause a 90% blocked artery to completely get to completely blocked artery, and not much clot comes out. And these are, if you uh, if you get a perspective, these are three millimeter sized arteries, average two to four and a half millimeters. So that's the 
So they are, if you take the, it's they're tiny. So I hope uh, that answers your question. Yes, we I protect. Do. We do not want blood clot. Blood clot, however, cannot go outside the artery and cause a stroke. It can only break and go downstream because once the artery is open, this flow will drive it into smaller and smaller vessels. Mm -hmm. But we do not want the blood clot to occlude smaller vessels either. <clears throat> Dr. Dev, I have a number of people that I know that are suffering from AFib. Mm -hmm. And quite commonly I hear, well, I might have a stroke from this. <laughs> What is the potential for stroke with you having AFib? Okay, so uh, atrial fibrillation is the upper chambers of the heart, they just fibrillate. The lower chambers of the heart start beating irregularly and fast. So the two components, upper chambers where that little appendages, left atrial appendage or that little um, closet, when the upper chamber is contracting, then it pushes out blood with every beat and there is no stagnant blood flow. When the atrial fibrillation happens, especially in the appendage, the blood just becomes stagnant. And blood is a strange tissue. If it's flowing, it's liquid. If it stops, it gels into a clot. So the left atrial appendage forms blood clots in atrial fibrillation. So that blood clot, if it pushes its head into the flow stream, gets knocked off and then circulates in the blood like a bullet trying to block an artery of its size. Very often it would cause strokes. That is the single most important reason why atrial fibrillation is so dreaded by all of us. Atrial fibrillation is not a lethal arrhythmia by itself. If you just control the rate, the heart is able to deal with atrial fibrillation with fair, fairly well. The heart cardiac function reduces by about 15 to 20 percent. But body adapts to that very easily because heart is able to increase its function by three, four hundred percent during exercise and if needed. So the point is atrial fibrillation by itself, if the rate was controlled with medications, would be a non-threatening arrhythmia except for the clot formation in the left atrial appendage. That's why these, they need to be treated with blood thinners. The older blood thinner, the cuminin, the red poison, or, which has worked very, very well for most people and saved lives. Uh, or there are newer medications that do not have drug interactions, do not need monitoring, everything else is good. You can eat what you, there is no drug in, interaction with food, but uh, the obvious catch, they're expensive. And hopefully, they would become a little cheaper, and uh, then we would likely not need to use cuminin. But there are other devices. As I said, the source of clots is the appendage, that finger-like projection of the left atrium. It's actually a vestigial organ. Body does not need it, but it's still there. It's like a appendix is there, and people have appendicitis, and some people die from it which is evolutionary paradox that a vestigial organ actually that should have gone away actually kills somebody. But that's how maybe we'll lose the appendix in the next two million years or the left atrial appendage, but it hasn't happened yet. So right now, if somebody has atrial fibrillation, we can put a plug through a catheter from the groin and seal that, and that can prevent blood clot formation as well. So people who cannot take blood thinners, for them, that's an optimal choice. Good. Hey. You're very welcome. Yes. Donna? I just want to say thank you, Dr. Dev, for making it so understandable. It was really a great presentation. And oh, I do have one welcome. question. Sure. Does alcohol and stimulants affect AFib? Yes. Uh, there is a entity called um, Saturday night atrial fibrillation. And people would have a bout of alcohol and would come to the hospital with atrial fibrillation. Uh, alcohol is a stimulant for the heart muscle. Uh, caffeine is as well. Other 
agents that are commonly used and people are not aware of them are the cough medications, things like um, pseudoephedrine. That's a stimulant. Um, sugars are stimulant to some degree. So if you have a couple of glasses of wine with dinner, then a chocolate cake and a cup of nice strong coffee, you set yourself up for having atrial fibrillation. And if you have a tendency to have atrial fibrillation, you will. If you don't, then you wouldn't. So not everybody would have it, but that's the kind of combination. If you have had atrial fibrillation, then you do not want to do these things in combination. You got, you got, you got alcohol, you got caffeine, you got sugar, and chocolate has caffeine as well. So, uh, and that can actually bring on what we call the paroxysmal or episodic atrial fibrillation in young people. And that, strangely, it seems happens more often in young athletes, people who work out on a very regular basis. Um, we've seen that they can have a, um, a episodic atrial fibrillation. Thank you. You're very welcome. Right. There are no other questions. On behalf of the Council on Aging, I'd like to thank you for a very informative talk. And personally, I'd like to thank you in case I'm the person whose life you just saved. Uh, so. Thank you very much. So, and thank you again to right. the Council on Aging. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 8 on our agenda are commissioner comments. Do we have any commissioner comments today? Yes, Donna. I just wanted to thank all of the volunteers out there that make so many of these events that we've talked about today possible. So thank you so much for volunteering your time. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Seeing none, we're adjourned.